integrative functional medicine nutritionist, and she's certified by the IFM and nutrition and um, as an IFM certified practitioner. And she's also an expert in fertility, and that's not a topic we've ever had here uh, on on our webinar. So I'm really excited, uh, Anina, for you to come on. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, so functional nutrition for fertility and pregnancy, as as we normally do, we will discuss today about um, community updates a bit. So I'm not going to go through this whole list, but you can uh, watch the recording later. These are the visits we're doing either virtually or in person um, right now. And um, there are many things in person. There are many things virtual, but this is kind of what we're doing. So I just want to give everyone an update on that, whether you're watching this live or you're watching the recording later. This is a helpful um, kind of slide in terms of what we're doing in the clinic here. COVID updates, uh, we usually just kind of are updating here the vaccine timeline for the rollout uh, for Maryland, Virginia, and DC. So you see that everyone's now in phase 1B, which includes healthcare workers, essential personnel, such as teachers, firefighters, police officers, and then age um, greater than uh, 75 and older for uh, Maryland, Virginia, and then 65 and older for, for DC. So there's some links there you can to be notified about things. You can click on those links depending on where you are. Um, I did want to say one thing, which is that there was some research that uh, was recently done in last week, trying to keep updated every week, uh, from Rockefeller New York, um, University in New York City that shows that the memory B cell response to the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, virus lasts for at least six months. So that's good news um, for those of you who have unfortunately got infected but, but have you know, survived this and your immune system is stronger for that. So even if the antibody cell antibody levels go down the blood, um, the, the memory B cells, and I think also the memory T cells are likely going to be proven to be uh, uh, have a robust response even even longer, even longer than six months. But so far, it's it's been a six month study, and that that's published in Nature. So there's a link there. Um, and I do think that, and we, we can talk about this later if you want, Anina, um, since you're an integrative functional nutritionist. But um, they did a study as part of that Rockefeller study that showed that half of people with COVID uh, nineteen symptoms. Um, actually, a colonization of their gut, uh, of their GI tract. So, you know, there is some thought about, you know, does COVID get colonized in the gut, and then that causes long-term fatigue for people, or, or you know, longer-term fatigue, and and other systemic symptoms. I wonder if it's being um, kind of sequestering in the gut a bit. Here's our upcoming schedule. So, Anina's on today. We have Dr. Kim and Bear on next week, talking about functional dentistry and oral health, and we have Shannon and Jade coming on uh, sound healing and yoga. I'm looking for that as well. Uh, starting into February, Rebecca Wong, no relationship to me, but a herbalist and acupuncturist. And she's in Toronto. She's going to be talking about traditional Chinese medicine and herbal therapies there for general health and general and specific questions that people may have. And then Dr. Carrie Jones is on, which uh, Andy and I both know pretty well, uh, is uh, the medical director of the Dutch test. And she's going to be talking about hormones again um, as the second time we're doing that with her and February 18th. So Liz Reese is going to be talking also. Um, Liz Reese is our heart math instructor. We have group visits that um, Jen could put in the entrance from the link chat. If you haven't heard of this yet, this is an amazing group uh, that uh, we're doing with Liz Reese here. And uh, we're going to be talking about just de stressing the nervous system. All right, so I think I'm going to stop the share and hand it over to Anina here. Known Anina for a, a long time here, and good friends here, and um, been really doing a lot of the functional medicine and kind of sharing those back and forth. Um, Anina, just real quickly, maybe just introduce yourself. I did give you a little bit of intro, but how did you get into, into functional medicine and functional nutrition? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Wong. I appreciate it. Uh, my name's Anina. I'm a registered dietitian and a functional nutritionist. I have a PhD. And um, I got into functional nutrition, I think the way many of us do, and that I wasn't getting answers from the conventional uh, medical system. Um, so even you know, in my 20s, I had surgery and I had some thyroid issues and I was just looking for other answers. And that's how I really kind of got into functional medicine, looking at the root cause of disease and trying to figure out what was going on instead of just trying to treat the symptom, trying to figure out what the problem is. And I grew into the fertility space. Um, I've been a functional nutritionist for nine years now in private practice, but I really enjoy working in for fertility patients um, and uh, pregnancy patients and new mom and babies, because I felt like this is an area of care that's missing for a lot of women. Um, we don't have specialists that really specialize in natural fertility in our conventional medical 
mm. world, we also don't have um, specialists for pregnancy. Like how do you support a woman in pregnancy? Their nutritional needs change dramatically and OBs aren't trained and they often don't have the time to work with women on that. And the postpartum period is a really difficult period for many women. And as a mom, I went through that myself. Um, and you have tremendous demands with breastfeeding, um, as well as the incredible change you have when you have a new baby just on your body physiologically, but also emotionally as well. So that's how I got into that space and really wanting to provide that care for other women that I saw that was a gap in my own experience, but also in many of my patients. And, and that's a valuable <laughs> service too, because you know health really starts in the in the womb preconception during pregnancy, that's in a way we can argue that's that's the the most important time to you know focus on health. That's really a deep level of prevention there at at you know right at birth and before birth. So um, yeah, thank you so much for doing that and being of service there. Um, um, have you found that uh, working with the conventional specialists that they're open to some of the things that that you're doing with fertility and pregnancy using functional medicine or? I think somewhat, I think there's some apprehension. I mean, I, I think as many people might know, your conventional medical doctor doesn't even have to receive an hour of nutrition training in his entire, his or her That's entire medical yeah. career. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a recognition that diet's right. important, but just how important nutrition can be, um, it, I think is not kind of always fully understood. So you yeah. know, people will refer, but it's understanding what I'm doing and what I'm working on and the extent that you can actually impact, as you said, Dr. Wong, I mean, egg health, has tremendous outcome, not just in terms of able to get pregnant and stay pregnant, but for the health of your baby in the future. Uh, so if yeah. it's less chromosomally abnormal, right. um, your baby is more likely to be really healthier. Really setting that, that person, that baby up for life, you know, with good health, with, with doing that. And I, I, I will have to say, Dr. Twain's on here too. Thank you. Um, Dr. Twain is our, our new doctor here, but we both went to Tufts Medical School, but, which has a school of nutrition, a good school of nutrition, although I do think it's fairly conventional. We definitely had to learn nutrition afterward, you know, after school uh, <laughs> goes out, but um, that's great. Well, uh, welcome again. And I think you have some slides, right? For, to, I do. So I'm going to share my screen now and just let me know that you guys can see it. Okay. Okay. Here. okay. Um, and everyone can see it. So as Dr. Wong mentioned, um, you know, my name is Anina. I founded a practice called Simplina. And he was asking me earlier, how did you come up with the name Simplina? And really is the idea is to simplify the process and make it easier for women uh, when they're trying to get pregnant to know the information that you need to know um, about natural health, integrative health, functional medicine to get pregnant, to stay pregnant, and also as a new mom with a baby. And so that's where the name came from. And I'm happy to talk to you today about fertility and pregnancy and how you can optimize your health. I do wanna also mention that um, even if you're not trying to get pregnant right at this moment, your nutrition matters now. Um, the more you can set yourself up from, uh, for optimal health, the better your outcome will be and your chances will be of conceiving. Um, so it's never you know, too early to start um, taking care of your health. And the only thing that side effect you can get is better health, which is what that's I love, what I do. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good message, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I founded the organization um, Simplina and we work on women's health. That's always been my area of specialty, but particularly in fertility, pregnancy and for new moms. Um, so one of the tenants I think that's really interesting in functional medicine is um, really kind of looking for a root cause. And I like this quote because it says, look and you will find it. What is sought will go undetected. And you know, about 40% of women get uh, a diagnosis of unexplained infertility. And what I would say from a functional medicine perspective is nothing is fully unexplained. <laughs> um, there's always an answer your body might not have. It might not be the only answer. It might not be the only cause, but you know, when I start digging in and look at thyroid health, adrenal health, immune system function, gut function, nutrients, I usually find something in every patient. And the thing for fertility is your body needs to be fully ready and optimized and have a lot of energy production in order to produce a healthy egg, um, in order for conception to occur, um, and in order for that embryo to grow um, and implant. So what we do is really try to look at like what else is here in your history, your genetics, um, that we could find answers to when you might get a diagnosis of unexplained infertility, or we're not sure why you're having difficulty conceiving. So I do want to have a little quiz. I know Jen's going to just pop this up um, and ask people if you have trouble with sleep, regular menstrual cycles, meaning your cycles are not uh, regular, maintaining a healthy weight or all of the above. If people could take just a few moments or a minute to answer the questions on the quiz.
I have a question while people are answering. Did you do you feel like during the COVID nineteen pandemic that people's sleep, weight, and menstrual cycles have been affected? The, the the people, the clients that you see, or or you know people that you know. Yeah, so I think it's one of those things that you know people kind of overlook. Like I don't sleep well, but I haven't slept well in a long time, or I've never slept well. I've had patients <laughs> who've never really slept for the night, right, always right, woken twice. Right. But that yeah. impacts your melatonin production. Melatonin is a powerful antioxidant for fertility. Yeah. Um, it also yeah. would your cortisol production if you're spiking at night um, can lead to blood sugar um, dysregulation, which can impact. Um, insulin and as well as um, your ability to then moderate your hormonal system. So that can impact your hormonal balance. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So they, um, so we have um, some people have trouble with sleep. If you were asleep, regular menstrual cycles, um, maintaining a healthy weight and all of the above. Um, So it, it seems like most of us have experienced one of these symptoms. And the point of the quiz is really that each of those symptoms can be a symptom that can impact your fertility as Dr. Wong was kind of getting it. So sleep is really important. I can't underestimate that enough. Um, so often we think, oh, that's just a side thing. <laughs> it's not. Um, we know that people who don't sleep well, if we control for every other factor, their BMIs are higher. So even if we control for diet and exercise, they'll have a higher body mass index just because they have dysregulated sleep. And, and that um, affects their hormones. Yeah, that, that affects that's them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. and impacts their hormones. Um, regular cycles, so I think many women um, you know, might not have had regular cycles early in life, and the common response in the OBGYN community is to put people on birth control pill if you, know, you don't need it for birth control, just to regulate your cycles. But when you're trying to get pregnant, it's really important that you're ovulating, the estrogen is surging, the progesterone comes up after that ovulation, and that that happens on a regular basis. And it could be 28 or 32 days, but it should be regular for you. Um, and so um, irregular cycles are a symptom of hormonal imbalance. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And certainly weight, if you have a hard time maintaining body weight. Um, so you do need a certain amount of fat for estrogen and estrogen production. Um, and then you also, if you have excessive amount of weight, that can dysregulate the hormonal balance as well. And that can disrupt, estrogen can become too high um, and it can suppress the progesterone and therefore suppress ovulation as well. All right, so moving on. Um, so I just talked about how these three areas can impact fertility. So what is infertility? Um, so it's defined as not being able to get pregnant after one year of unprotected and timed sex. And that time part is important. Um, so making sure that you are having intercourse when you are ovulating, that is key. And in women over 35, it's six months just because the time is more of a, the essence. And so that's the clinical definition of infertility. Um, about 10% of women have trouble getting pregnant or staying pregnant, and that's a CDC stat. Um, that we think some of the real numbers are higher because it's hard to gather that data, um, but infertility is an issue, and it's also on the rise. So in 2017, we had the highest rate, um, lowest rate of fertility basically since um, we started keeping records in 1917 in about 100 years, and there's a, a number of reasons for that. Um, one is advancing age, more women are, are older when they um, do try to conceive for the first time and they're getting pregnant later. Lifestyle factors. So um, having a chronic disease risk factor. Um, so whether it's prediabetes, um, excess weight, um, other issues can actually uh, inhibit your ability to get pregnant and stay pregnant. The environment, and I can't stress this enough, um, you know, plastics, um, estrogen mimickers, BPA, um, all of these have impacted our hormonal cycles um, as well as overdriving estrogen. And that's a big issue. And that's a lot of personal care products too, your conventional shampoos and um, soaps and so forth. Uh, male health. So, you know, I think so often in the IVF world, the focus is on the woman um, because the treatments are really focused on women. The idea is if a sperm test is okay, motility and sperm count is somewhat normal, <laughs> they kind of write men off. But you guys need to remember that men are 50% of the equation. Um, sperm health is absolutely yeah. essential. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what your partner does, how he lives, whether he smokes, um, his exercise level, if he's carrying his cell phone in his pocket all the time, that matters. Um, and there's actually better data on male infertility on the rise than in, there is for female, just because it's easier to study um, than it is to study A quality. And also there's an issue of the role of long-term birth control use. Um, so IUIs, IUDs, um, women on the pill for 15 years, 
uh, vasectomies or people are reversing vasectomies later in life, that's also contributing to the infertility um, stat. So from the functional medicine perspective, what do we look at? Um, so look at genetics. Um, so, you know, having SMPs, MTHFR mutations um, is one example. Lifestyle, how you're living every day. Um, hormonal balance, what, does, what do your hormones look like through that whole cycle? And Dr. Wong and I have talked about um, the Dutch um, cycle mapping test. It's a full month that CAH does. I also do it. It's a great way to look at like what's happening in the full month, not just on one day, but you know, how does your cycle um, balancing out? Um, thyroid adrenal health. Um, thyroid is very important for fertility. Um, most conventional IVF clinics do test for TSH. They usually don't go beyond it, um, but that is very important um, for maintaining the metabolism that you need um, to have good embryonic growth. Stress hormones and cortisol production, sleep, energy, biotransformation and elimination, and your immune system, and nutrient insufficiency. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I haven't had one patient that has necessarily a perfect profile of everything. Um, there's always something that I can find. And a lot of us think I eat well, you know, I can't possibly be deficient in something. And I think when we start testing and not just guessing, uh, we find otherwise. So a standard fertility workup is really, um, you know, when you go to a clinic though, um, whether it's before IVF or at IVF, they'll do a basic TSH, they'll run a CBC, they'll run an AMH, looking at your ovarian reserve, and they might do an HSG. Um, you know, and then after you had, and unfortunately in the conventional system, it takes like two or three miscarriages or failure to conceive with multiple cycles of IVF before they really do more extensive testing, uh, looking at progesterone, your full genetic screening panel, um, and also doing more diagnostic testing like hysteroscopy, transvaginal ultrasound, even endometrial biopsies. Uh, but whereas in functional medicine approach, the idea is like, let's do a lot of this testing upfront if we can. Um, do a full hormone panel, do a thyroid panel. So CAH does a great job. Their thyroid panel is really extensive, right? You're doing 3T3, 3T4, you're doing thyroid peroxidase antibodies. I mean, Dr. Wong and the practitioners there are looking at your full profile. And that's something that we want because your TSH could be normal, but other things could not be. Uh, doing an iron panel, looking at your immune system, anti-nuclear antibodies, vitamin D3 has been shown to have an impact in fertility, um, your hemoglobin A1C and how well your blood glucose is functioning over time, as well as an AMH. Um, for functional labs, um, I use Vibrant America and I also um, use SpectraCell and I know CAH, you do that as well. And that gives you that full panel of nutrients. And that's really important because we can't through LabCorp test all the nutrients that we would like to test. We can do some one-off ones, B12, B6, vitamin D3, but we can't get the full panel. And you really need that full panel because each of those nutrients and minerals and vitamins and minerals play a role in your body's metabolic function, and they all have a role to play in energy production, which ultimately is important for fertility. I do recommend the GI MAP test, which I know CH does as well, and the Dutch test, and looking at your genetic SNP. So there's a number of ways you can do that. I mean, you can do it ancestry.com and you can convert it, or you can do it through uh, some of that testing through LabCorp as well. And then diagnostic testing. I'm big on having transvaginal ultrasounds just to see if you have polyps. Do you have polyps in the uterus? Do you have polyps um, and on the cervix? I mean, those little polyps can inhibit um, fertility and it's something that we wanna know. You don't wanna wait you know, two years into trying to conceive to find out that's actually the problem. It's actually a mechanical issue and something like that can be removed. Um, or if you have blocked fallopian tubes, it's good to know that upfront. Um, there are things in natural health too that we can do to enhance that. Um, so it's a different approach to fertility and functional medicine. And I would say, you know, one thing to think about is this whole concept of biological age. So, it, you know, I think so often if you go into an IVF clinic or you talk to your OB, they're like, you're over 35, you're high risk. <laughs> your chances of getting pregnant drop off dramatically as if you just jumped off a cliff between 34 and 35. Um, and that's not really the case. Um, there is a shift, but you have to remember that's based on um, a lot of other data and that's based on an average um, and an average within the standard American population. Um, so we talk about a nutrition standard American diet, but there's also, you know, you're pulling an average from um, the full population. And then it's not looking at your biological age. So we all know people who like, you know, they look like 30 when they're 40. And then there's the people who are 40, but look like they're 50. And it's not just how you look, but how you are physiologically inside. And that is more of your biological age. And we can do a host of testing, but also it's just really good living um, and how you live your life to reduce your 
um, biological age. So your number will still go up, but you don't advance in age as rapidly as you do with the age of your, the number um, in which you are. So I thought it was just important to talk about biological age and how it's determined. And it's determined by telomeres, which are the nucleotides at the end of chromosomes. And if you're in the fertility world, you hear a lot discuss about chromosomes and chromosomal abnormalities, which are a cause for infertility and repeated miscarriages. Um, so basically these telomeres dictate how quickly cells age and die. And the higher your age number is, the shorter your telomeres. But actually a healthy lifestyle um, can reduce reverse aging by lengthening those telomeres. So not only can you, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of stop the reduce the aging process, but you can even reverse it in some cases. And I wanted to show this slide because this is Vera Wang on the top. And if you can see her, she is 70 and this picture was taken when she was 70. Um, below is a picture of a woman who um, is 70, she was categorized as age 70 on, <laughs> on Google. But the difference in the aging process um, is tremendous. And so DNA methylation, I think many of us have heard about MTHFR, um, genetic SNPs, which I mentioned, and methylation. So cell use, cells use DNA methylation to control gene expression, and it can turn genes off. And so it's really important that you want to turn like the bad genes off um, and have chromosomal stability. And there's different things you can do with diet and also targeted nutrient support if you have certain genetic SNPs to reduce that um, aging process. So what do I do for my patients? Well, the thing is, even though I'm just a nutritionist, I don't just do nutrition exercise, nutrition alone. I do exercise, I do sleep, mental health, work on the environment, cleaning and greening the environment, and also finding a sense of purpose because your mental health, not just in terms of the support system you have, um, but also your purpose in life behind just having a kid or being a mom or so forth, having this world outside of that is really key. So I'll give you a case study. Um, I had a 37 year old um, who came to me and you know, when she came to me, she felt like she was you know, so fragile. I felt like if I could touch her, she would just crack. Um, she was in tears. She had this massive binder of all her health results. Um, she had been to three different IVF clinics. Um, so over a period of time, she had had heavy periods, long-term birth control use. She had had five failed IVF cycles by age 37, um, three miscarriages. Um, she had low ovarian reserve. She had an AMH around 0.3. She was iron deficient. Um, she was slightly elevated TSH. She had tested negative for celiac. Um, and she was told by the last clinic that there was no option for her to conceive, um, which I think is heartbreaking for any of us to hear that. But I also don't think it's the role of another practitioner to always tell you um, what your future options are. And because there is possibility when you really take care of your health and what that possibility will bring, we don't know, but um, I would never rule anything out, whether it's any health condition, heart disease or cancer or infertility. So I did blood hormone testing. This was before I was doing the Dutch test on day three, 12 and 21. Um, ladies, if you are getting blood hormone testing, you really wanna make sure it's timed. I, I have so many patients that come back to me and they were doing progesterone on day three or an estrogen on day 18 it has got to be timed appropriately if you're gonna do the blood hormone testing or else it's really useless. Uh, a chem 14 thyroid panel iron, um, looking at her blood glucose or hemoglobin A1C, a celiac panel again, um, because those numbers can change uh, depending on people's exposure to gluten. So if they're gluten-free, celiac, celiac panel will be, come back negative. They start eating gluten, then you can see it come turn positive. And then looking at her genetic SMPs. Um, so I had this full program um, for her set out. Um, so we removed gluten permanently, even though she was negative for celiac, there's a lot of evidence that glyphosate, phosphate, um, which the US uses, um, it's a genetically modified product and its wheat production uh, can harm fertility uh, because it kills bugs um, upon eating it. And so the question is like how it's actually working in the gut. And there are some long-term studies looking at its negative effects uh, going on right now. A higher protein, lower carb diet, you really wanna balance that blood sugar. You need to have a really, really nice insulin control. Um, electrolytes and water intake. So that's really important for cervical mucus production and also nutrient absorption. Um, so, so often my patients are drinking a lot of water, but they're not getting the electrolytes, that's sodium and potassium. And the sodium and potassium need to be balanced just at the right level to allow um, nutrients to get into cells and also for good cervical mucus production, which you need to conceive. Um, it's also very important for men um, for sperm motility. 
supplements I put her on were prenatal with methylated folate. Um, she did have one of the genetic SNPs um, for MTHFR. Mitochondrial support, uh, so that's ubiquinol, D-ribose, um, PQQ, and egg health includes the ubiquinol as well. Probiotic and chromium, and chromium is really for good blood sugar control. It's a mineral that used to be abundant in our soil, um, but as we do topsoil farming, it's become deficient. Uh, many of us become deficient in it, and it's really important for balancing blood glucose, and it's an easy way to do that. I reduced her high intensity orange theory workouts. I have a lot of patients who like a lot of high intensity exercise. It's not ideal when you're trying to conceive. You wanna make sure you don't alter your cycles um, and certainly stop bleeding as well. But just the high intensity is a little bit too much. And doing stress reduction and support. As I said, she was really fragile. Um, you know, she literally felt like she was gonna fall apart. And so really getting her into a good therapist, um, finding a support group. There are plenty of free support groups for infertility and miscarriages. Um, in this area alone. So it's something, and now they're all virtual. So they're pretty easily accessible. i um, greening her personal care products. That's just you know, getting the synthetic chemicals out and sleep hygiene. And so um, before someone's trying to conceive and trying to get through the detox process, um, I'll sometimes prescribe tryptophan and calm, which many of you know with the magnesium, and that can be helpful for sleep. So she had seven years of infertility struggles. After six months of doing everything that I had asked her to do and being part of our program, she conceived naturally. Um, and she actually went on to have a healthy pregnancy with no complications um, and vaginal delivery, did a full-term baby girl. Um, again, that was after five failed IVF cycles and three miscarriages, and I'm so happy for her. And um, she's a mom and I work with her now on breastfeeding and uh, feeding her baby and introducing new foods. I'll just quickly mention a second case study is a 32 year old patient of mine who tried three years unsuccessfully of trying to conceive. She had a failed IUI, she had a miscarriage. She also had a lot of heavy bleeding um, and that doctors hadn't really looked at as a potential cause of hormonal imbalance before. With her, I did the Dutch 30 day Dutch hormone testing. I did some basic blood workup, the chem 14, thyroid panel, iron panel, hemoglobin A1C. I did the GI map, um, listening to her and her partner talk. Her partner traveled extensively around the world um, to a lot of developing countries and had had parasites in the past. And so it's really important your gut function can impact um, your nutrient absorption as well as your hormonal balance. So we wanted to see if there were any issues there. And again, looked at genetic SMPs, um, MTA. Jar, Calm T, and other ones that can impact fertility. Um, so for her, I did an elimination diet, removed dairy and gluten um, permanently for the time that she's trying to conceive. I did seed cycling, which is how you have different types of seeds at different points of your cycle to support estrogen and progesterone production. So she was dominant in estrogen and she was surging way too early in her cycle um, and not producing enough progesterone. What I like about seed cycling is it's a natural way to try to balance hormones. Um, and an organic um, diagnostic working group, Dirty Dozen. So if you can't afford 100% organic all the time, completely understandable, but um, looking at a diagnostic working group website is really important. They have a Dirty Dozen of foods you should absolutely not be eating and conventional grapes being one, apples, um, strawberries and so forth. And so really avoiding those, making sure that those are organic. And then adding fermented foods, she had dysbiosis in the gut. Um, Luckily, no parasites, um, but a decent amount of dysbiosis going on for both her and her husband. And so they were both on um, fermented foods and probiotics to really support gut health. I had her do PDG testing for ovulation, which you can do on day 21, day 22, and to look at whether that progesterone is surging enough to ovulate, um, to have ovulated. And uh, in the beginning, she wasn't, now she is. And so that's a good thing to know. You don't wanna be trying to conceive if you um, aren't actually fully ovulating. Electrolytes and water intake, um, supplements, Vitex. Um, many of you might know there's chase berry extract with a hormonal balance. That's a gentle way to work on that excess estrogen and progesterone without really creating too much of an imbalance in the system. Prenatal with methylated folate, that's a standard recommendation I make uh, for anyone who's thinking about conceiving in the future or trying to conceive now. Um, so with the blood clotting um, and the excessively cloudy periods, fish oil and curcumin in the first half of the cycle only, um, mitochondria and egg health support. So moderate running, again, another type A, um, a lot of excessive cardio exercise. So really trying to slow that down a bit and then having yoga, some slower movement, walking, 
Um, you want to kind of reduce the cortisol <laughs> reduction. We don't want to kind of keep it peaked throughout the whole day. Stress reduction with meditation apps and hypnotherapy, which I find can be really effective in really getting people to deeply calm down um, and relax. Greening her home and personal care. So she was a teacher and she was working at home. She had laptops all over the place. So ladies know laptops and men too, right on your lap. <laughs> um, you know, and you should have EMF protective coverings um, around your phone, um, underneath your computer and turning off your wireless at night is important. Uh, good sleep hygiene and also a roadmap. I think when someone's younger, the IVF planners are like, oh, you know, you can just try IVF and go from IUI to IVF. You don't really know where you're gonna go next. Um, it really helps patients to know, uh, you know, what next? And for us, what we decided is we're gonna give her three months to change things before she starts trying and then another six months to try um, and we'll tweak things along the way and see where that takes her. Um, so clinical PERS about fertility, our existing health symptoms can be a sign of underlying issues. They simply expose imbalances in the body and we notice them because we're trying to get pregnant. Um, it's on the rise, partly due to decline in health and advancing maternal age. Um, utilize functional medicine to look for other answers, how well your body is functioning. Um, utilize everything that's available to you, conventional lab testing, functional testing. Um, your provider should be doing a detailed case analysis of your story and get diagnostic testing early. Don't wait you know, for third miscarriage or two years of um, failed IVF cycles before you get all the testing that you need. Just get it up front and figure out, if, is that the issue? Um, even, and you have to ask your doctor for it in a lot of cases and push for it. Remember, optimal health equals lower biological age. And a personalized health program incorporates changes um, that can reduce your genetic risk and be targeted just to your genes. Um, and the nice thing about natural fertility is it opens up possibilities without any side effects. Um, very quickly now, I'm gonna talk about pregnancy and then we'll open this up for questions afterwards. Um, so pregnancy, one thing we all have to understand is that your nutrient needs increase and the food you eat is the main source of nutrients for the baby. So it is really important to have a well-nourished, balanced diet when you are pregnant. Um, you have additional needs. So calories, you need more food total. You need calcium, you need vitamin A, vitamin C, D, B6, B12, and folate. And if you have the MTAs, it's so far, or some genetic SNPs, you could not be getting the folate that you need, the B6 or the B12. So that's why it's really important to have methylated versions um, of those supplements. I do wanna just mention pregnancy and weight gain. I'm always most concerned that my patients are gaining weight. Um, I'm not too worried about the excessive weight as long as it's not too much, but you've gotta be gaining enough weight to get those nutrients to the baby and also uh, for your own supply. So if you are not eating enough, what happens is that your body goes and pulls those nutrients from the bone, from your blood um, to utilize because it needs that. And that put, makes you deficient. And there's a risk for that um, in pregnancy and complications in labor and postpartum if that continues for a long period of time. Uh, so the functional medicine approach to pregnancy is um, you're really doing a full panel. Um, again, the functional testing that I mentioned, as well as um, the regular labs, Diagnostic testing. Um, if you are already pregnant, I'm not a fan of excessive using of diagnostic testing, including ultrasounds. Um, if you need to do a standard ultrasound, that's great, but you don't want to use ultrasounds excessively. There's some data to show um, that it could be harmful um, if used excessively, so we don't want to do that. So I just want to mention that to patients as well. And oh, just go back. Um, so as I talked about, we have the basic care plan. And then here's a case study. I had a um, just this past August, a 41 year old come to me at 15 weeks. She had gestational diabetes. She had rheumatoid arthritis, um, elevated body mass index at 29.8. She was iron deficient and she was also vegetarian. Um, she had hypertension and she had hyperthyroidism. So she had a range of issues that were gonna put her at risk for carrying that pregnancy fully, uh, as well as potential complications that could um, exacerbate in labor and put her at risk for preeclampsia or so forth. So we did a, a full panel. Um, you know, we did some nutrient testing for her. I did Genova just because um, she was remote and that was an easier thing to do. And that's a urine test. And we did look for MTHR. Um, so we ended up putting on a high protein, higher fat, complex carb, nutrient dense diet. Um, even though she, her BMI was higher, if we can do higher protein and lower carb, we can kind of level um, some of that excess weight gain, but you get the nutrients that you need and you need good quality fats and you need good quality protein. 
Um, so, you know, low fat or um, not eating enough is not an option when you are pregnant. Avoiding the dirty dozen, as I mentioned, um, having organic protein and reducing gluten. I didn't eliminate it for her because these were a lot of changes for her to make. And she had pretty much a standard American diet. Um, electrolytes and water, uh, which are very important in pregnancy. Uh, having a prenatal of methylated folate, you know, because she did have the genetic SNP. As I mentioned, 40, 60% of the population does. So it's really common. Um, chromium to really balance that blood sugar. Gamma-linolenic acid to work with the rheumatoid arthritis. Um, her um, rheumatoid, uh, her doctor who was working with her on rheumatoid arthritis wanted to keep her on high dose medication. We were able to do gamma-linolenic acid at a decently high dose and she was able to wean off that medication, which is always better uh, for a baby and mom if you can handle it. Um, probiotic um, liver capsules. So she, she was iron deficient and she was vegetarian and she wasn't crazy about eating meat. She did eventually um, start eating some red meat and then, but she took liver caps and I like liver caps versus just regular iron, ferrous sulfate, cause that can actually get toxic in high doses. Um, the synthetic iron, whereas when you have it from a natural food source, you don't have to worry about that risk. And it comes with other B vitamins. Vitamin C to help that iron absorption, um, a D3, she was low in D3 and you need K2 uh, to absorb D3. Choline, very important for baby's brain. Uh, and DHEA, also very important for baby's brain. Um, moderate to low intensive cardio. Remember she had rheumatoid arthritis. So like Matt Pilates, nothing where you're doing a lot of resistance, even walking for a long period could be painful for her. Um, so bands for strengthening, you know, the physical therapy bands, again, it's not weights, you're not putting too much pressure on the joints. A stress reduction um, with meditation apps and hypnotherapy, greening her home. Uh, you know, she was working from home, she was pregnant, really making sure that, um, you know, she had the EMF protection for her pregnancy. So there are shirts that you can buy with EMF protection um, coverage on them for pregnant women. So I had her in that. Um, sleep hygiene and the fact that her nutrient needs change by a trimester. So we worked throughout her pregnancy from 15 weeks on and um, we changed her supplementation based on that. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and so I think now <clears throat> I'm here to answer any questions that you have, but I wanted to say that if you'd like to make an appointment or you're interested in working with me on fertility, here's my contact information as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anina. Um, uh, Lisa had a question on, um, on a regular cycle. So what, what have been some of the reasons for irregular cycles in terms of hormonal imbalances? I guess what type of hormonal balances would lead to irregular cycles and how have they been resolved? Sure. So there's a number of reasons for irregular cycles. Um, it can be blood glucose. Um, so poor insulin metabolism can change that. Stress, cortisol reduction can uh, change your cycle. Um, you know, whether or not you ever started with regular cycles. So I have patients who were started on birth control right from the beginning because they uh, weren't cycling. And so their body actually never regulated from an, a young age. They've been on birth control until they tried to conceive, you know, for 12, 15, some cases, 20 years. Um, so your body had not picked up that process. Um, you can have excess estrogen and that's more common in our society with all the estrogen mimickers, all the plastic. Um, in America, uh, it is okay to feed animals estrogen and um, hormones to make them fatter, chickens, beef, um, pigs. That is banned in Europe and the EU um, because you are basically taking birth controls in, <laughs> birth control in and excess hormones when you eat those products. That's why I'm really big on organic meats. I know it's or grass-fed beef are local um, versus your conventional um, beef and dairy uh, for that. And so how have they been resolved? Um, so one is to figure out where you're falling off. And there's a lot of different things that can be part of the reason for hormonal imbalance. It could be progesterone driven, it could be estrogen, it could be just how you're, you could be, not be ovulating. So doing a Dutch um, cycle mapping test is important to kind of figure out where you're falling off. Um, and then doing things like herbs that are adaptogen, so chaseberry, uh, which is nice because it, it doesn't just promote one thing or the other. It has a progesterone-like effect, um, but it can balance the cycle overall. Um, seed cycling, um, you can look that up where you take pumpkin seeds in the first half of your cycle and sesame seeds in the second half of your cycle is a natural way to help balance hormones. Um, and eating a really clean diet. So I find when I clean up my patient's diets, get the blood sugar under tight control using chromium, a lot of times I can get their cycles to balance out better. Great. Um, Molly has a question on, uh, what are your thoughts on gestational diabetes? Uh, um, I guess that means in relation to fertility, I'm assuming. Yeah, so I'll go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, so blood sugar is really important. I can't stress that enough. I think you saw every time I had a case study, I was looking at their hemoglobin A1C, I was looking at fasting blood glucose. Blood sugar um, and insulin dysregulation can drive uh, changes in cortisol production. Um, it can change your nutrient absorption. It is really important. Um, so it can, it can affect fertility status, both fertility status and pregnancy health too, right? That's right, because it changes your hormones. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a risk of infertility because um, it can change your hormonal balance and it can, um, you cannot be, your hormones cannot be cycling. Uh, normally, and pregnancy is absolutely crucial because if there's excess blood sugar, um, insulin in the blood, that's a risk to the baby. Um, and actually, it can, at a high level, it can put you at risk for a miscarriage um, or <clears throat> a stillbirth or an early going into labor early. So it's really important to get that under control. Uh, the thing is, I, you know, I've heard patients come back to me where doctors say there's nothing we can do about gestational diabetes. My 41 year old patient was an example of that. We got her blood glucose, we moved her hemoglobin A1C down within a normal range within probably six weeks of yeah, hydrochromium yeah. supplementation. Yeah, that, that, so that, that right, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's reversible with the right life. So I think it's a good point is that now when you did that with that patient, um, where you, she, she was able to still eat uh, enough food and you know, enough calories or enough, enough food basically keep, keep the, keeping the baby a healthy weight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Absolutely. Um, great. Um, I have a question about methylation <laughs> since interest of mine. What is methylation, first of all, in general? I think that's a good thing to review for everyone. And then how does methylation and MTH of R in particular affect fertility? Yeah, so methylation is a process in which methyl groups are added to a DNA molecule, and that might seem like really esoteric, but basically methylation helps with every function in the body, your cardiovascular function, your immune function, your energy production. Um, it's a really important process, and it regulates gene expression. And so I think all of us know, like, oh, I'm at risk for heart disease in my family because I have had family members have a heart attack earlier in life. But just because that risk is there doesn't mean that has to be your risk. Um, and what I love about studying genetics um, and methylation is there are things we could do with targeted supplementation to reduce that risk. Um, so you can basically stop some of those genes from being expressed um, with the right products. So like for example, MTHFR, which I talked about a lot. So that's important for fertility because there's evidence to show uh, women with the MTHFR mutation, particularly C677T, are, have more trouble getting pregnant um, and they're more likely to miscarry um, because of high homocysteine levels. And I just lost everybody. So could everyone hear me? Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I, I brought your screen down so we could see your face. Okay, I'll exit my full screen. So. Yeah, so, so methylation. So, so how do you support methylation for, for um, fertility and pregnancy? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, the big thing is that you want to have your methylated supplements. So once get tested. Um, so that's the first thing. I think that's important. But I would say you don't wait six, eight weeks, just start taking methylated supplements. Like mm -hmm. all of your multi, even if you're not on a prenatal right now, should contain methyl tetrahydrofolate. I just mm -hmm. think it's a better thing to do around the block. Your B vitamins should be methylated. So adenosyl hydroxy um, B12, P5P mm -hmm. for your B6. Those are just some basic things that you can support methylation. Detoxification, uh, drinking lots of water, um, alcohol inhibits um, methylation. So, you know, you shouldn't really be drinking anyway, I think, but, you know, really try to limit the alcohol intake yeah. because that can inhibit That's a good um, point. Methylation. That's a great point. And, and the, certainly all the things you mentioned in the beginning, the sleep, the stress management, the healthy movement, all that will support methylation, getting the protein. Um, how do we support healthy, ooh, Molly got some good questions here. Oh, actually, Ayla, let's do Ayla's first. Um, Ayla said, uh, have, have you heard of someone passing the pregnancy three-hour glucose test but still having blood sugar spikes while eating carbs at home? That's interesting. Yeah, so remember, tests are at one point in time, right? So the fact that everybody does this um, three-hour fasting blood glucose at week 22 <laughs> to 26, that's a point in time. Um, point, yeah. And it's a morning in time too. So if I've seen, I have patients who are fully diabetic or type 2 diabetes who have great dietary control. They get stressed out and their insulin is off mm. the charts. Wow. Um, so there's a huge stress component that uh, impacts stress insulin. That's what raises the cortisol, which then raises the insulin. Is that okay? 
That's right. Um, so, and it's not a fun test to go in and be stuck at the hospital or the doctor's office for three hours drinking sugar liquid and then waiting. From the waiting. Yeah. <laughs> See if things yeah. are abnormal. So, um, but you could also have a normal test and then, but your day to day is what matters. And if you're measuring at home, you absolutely could be abnormal. And that day, for whatever reason, was normal. Um, you know, maybe you worked out the day. So before, they could be spiking uh, at one or two hours, like too high, but then by three hours, that curve is normal so then that might be normal on that three-hour test right that's right so i do think regular testing whether you're not doing it at home but um your doctor should be regularly measuring your blood glucose and that's also why i like a hemoglobin a1c on top of a fasting blood glucose to look at that mm -hmm. long-term measure and fasting yeah. insulin is good too that's a nice test it could be nice um how do we support uh molly has another uh question here um great question how do we support healthy telomeres that's a great great e question so that's a great thing. So they show like when we look epidemiologically at populations. Um, so in Japan, um, you have like the highest number of centurions in the world. Hmm. Um, and people live to 110 and they also live to 110 well, which is amazing. Yeah. And so yeah. you look at what what is that picture? Um, so their diet is a very basic diet. It's very alkaline. Um, it's not very acidic. Um, mm. The traditional diet is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of greens and seaweed, um, some seafood, lower on the beef and the dairy side, very low processed sugar, green yeah. tea. Yeah. Um, so the Onkawan diet too, they also have the limestone as well. Huge social support. So you think like, oh, it's all in nutrition, but they find like communities that have a lot of social support they age really well. Mm -hmm. um, and in America, we have one of the highest levels of isolation, Britain too. Um, there's a whole loneliness epidemic. And the current Surgeon General that's being appointed wrote a book on loneliness. Um, and I think it's, and COVID-19 is where COVID doesn't help all that. of us yeah. revisiting yeah. that, you know, wow. that wow. does matter. Yeah. But so living really well, um, you know, not just with nutrition and having a non-acidic diet, but having social support, yeah. exercise, yeah. good cardiovascular health can help. Yeah, yeah, great, great, thank you. Um, any, uh, we have a couple more minutes here. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. You said you like the ancestry. I, I won't focus too much on genetics because I know there's a lot more, more to that. Um, so when, um, uh, when should someone start taking, this is a general question, I think for pregnancy, but when should someone start taking the multivitamin or kind of getting ready for pregnancy? You said really at any time could be the time, right? Um, yeah, I always tell my patients, um, no matter where you are in the cycle, you should be taking a multi, <laughs> just as like insurance. I feel like it's like auto insurance. Everyone should yeah. be doing that and a with a good insurance. quality methylated product. So I know CAH uses those products. I use those products. You're not going to buy them off the shelf. I, I almost never find methyl tetrahydrofolate, even yeah, off they're the not shelf gonna be, and uh, Whole Foods. Products. It's going to be sold through yeah. a practitioner. Right. Right. Uh, methyl B12 versus hydroxy adensyl B12. You're thinking maybe the hydroxy adensyl more than the methyl B12 for, for people? or Yeah, for especially COMT mutation and even the MTHFR, yeah, um, they don't yeah. process the methyl. It doesn't yeah. mean you don't need any methyl, but you know a lot of products have added methyl B12, so you don't have to worry about supplementing that as much as adenosyl yeah. hydroxy. Great. Um, Evelyn said, uh, uh, first of all, Jen, Jen said, um, yeah, or any resources for non-toxic personal care products? Because we know that the toxins in the environment are really one of the major causes, I think, of, of infertility of the endocrine disrupting chemicals, obesogens that then raise insulin that make it harder too. So what are your resources for non-toxic personal care products? Just a personal question. Do you, ha do you have any favorites for, you know, skin care, hair care? I know that everyone's interested in that too. Yeah, so I've like been on a long term search to do this. I use the Environmental Working Group website, and also there's an app called Think Dirty, um, oh, where it lists toxicity of products. So, like, I have a kelp shampoo from New Zealand. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and care. it's called Living yeah. Nature. Um, and I really like those products because you'll find a lot of products in the US, although they're cleaner, they're not as clean as what you can get from Europe. They, they get, you know, the, the natural products, a lot of them in the US get bought up by these corporations. Like, that's why I noticed is like, even Jason's. Store. And then they get they get bought up by some huge corporation, and then the next thing you know, they have so sodium lauryl, lauryl sulfate in them. <laughs> but there's yeah, still Burt's bees got brought up by the people who make Clorox. Kind of yeah. Um, right. So yeah, there's a lot of products like that. Um, uh, so ewg.org skin deep. That's the the big site. Right, skin environmental deep is environmental, environmental and they rank the products. Right. Um, and you'll see some products. There's no evidence. They don't have the data, but there's usually one in a couple in every category, from shampoo to makeup that hmm. you can find that and are. You like living nature kelp shampoo in New Zealand? I didn't know they. Uh, 
Is that right? It's called Living Nature. Yeah. So I don't know. I just found this great shampoo. It was on um, Environmental Working Group and I ordered okay. it and it actually worked. Because I think a hard thing many of us uh, understand is sometimes the natural products don't work the same. Don't work the and same. No, conventional products, whether it's even a laundry detergent, you're not going to run around smelling like a laundry room. Right. Um, right. <laughs> and so you great. have to find like your balance. Um, okay. It's a great question um, from Evelyn. So, um, very low in iron due to fibroids have been working on increasing and I take supplements, don't really eat beef. First of all, we know that fibroids is usually related to estrogen dominance. There's some inflammatory system going on with the gut and you know estrogen, mm -hmm. uh, progesterone balance off, but any advice on how to increase that iron? Um, I will say one thing, just medically, you wanna get maybe an ultrasound and those type of things. That's what you would consider looking with, with your practitioner about just to see how big that fibroid is. But um, yeah. What, what's your thoughts on that? How to how to up the iron there? So I'm all about the bioavailable form of iron. So uh, you'll hear nutritionists say that, and it means a more absorbable form. Mm -hmm. And the kind of iron in conventional supplements called ferrous sulfate, and it's synthetic. You actually, mm -hmm. in one of my nutrition classes, we put magnets in cereal, and we pull the magnets out, and you can see the ferrous sulfate all stuck to the, oh, no. the magnets. Oh uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what you're having when you have fortified cereal. But the key thing is like, I like liver capsules. I like eating beef because it's highly bioavailable form. And the yeah, key but, thing is having vitamin C with that. So vitamin C helps the uptake of iron. So you should be having yeah. fresh fruit, citrus. She, she doesn't eat beef. I think she said she doesn't eat beef. So let's, uh, is there any other sources of uh, iron that you would? Yeah, have? so nettle root tea is another great source of iron. It's vegetarian and it's very absorbable. Nettle root tea, okay, great. Um, what about the chicken, pork? fish are there is there a lot of iron in the other animal proteins or, or no so the darker the meat the more iron so i always tell my patients if you're going to eat chicken dark meat. Um, or turkey dark meat um white meat doesn't have any iron the darker the meat so that's why lamb liver <laughs> um mm -hmm. venison they're really high in iron and the lighter your meat gets uh, the cut of it the less iron is there molasses is supposed to be high in iron right although i don't know how healthy that is but uh <laughs> Yeah, no, it actually is high. It's got sugar in it, but it's also yeah. a great source uh, of B12 yeah. and B6. Yeah. Um, so I recommend um, unsulfured molasses. I put it mm -hmm. on my buckwheat pancakes in the morning. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Toyin asked, okay, so what would you say are the root causes of morning sickness? Is it just the increased hormones and sugar imbalance? Um, and how do you address morning sickness? So the way I do it is different. So there's a lot of causes for morning sickness and certainly the changes your body are going through. But the key thing is that your hydrochloric acid in your stomach put is down, right? Um, mm. Because your body is dealing with all this hormonal production and growth of the placenta. Um, so the first three months are really critical in the growth and the demands on your body are high. So your blood goes to your extremities, right? Light or fright, uh, fight, and it's away oh. from your stomach. Is, so hydrochloric acid is lower. Okay. And so the biggest thing I do is electrolytes Mm -hmm. high dose electrolytes. And if I can get you to have enough um, chloride um, and hydrogen, you can actually produce the stomach acid you need to better digest your food. So a lot of morning sickness is you don't have the stomach acid. So your body doesn't want it because it knows that it can't break it down and keep it down. So, so what kind of, um, I'm, I'm assuming for a, for a pregnant woman, you wouldn't want to give someone betaine or do you give them betaine HCL also? Say that again. Um, I'm sorry. Do, do you give HCL capsules to to you, people that are pregnant, or? Um. So you could do HCL capsules, but I actually just prefer making your own electrolytes. But you've got to have enough sodium. So I feel like my patients always want to skim on the sodium because we hear salt is bad. Yeah. You have to follow an electrolyte recipe. I have my own that I use for pregnancy okay. and labor. Um. Okay, cool. It involves a number of different products, but you have coconut water where you've got to have that Celtic sea salt in there. Oh, um, okay. I have okay. it right at the right ratio. Yeah. 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 Get get the sodium, potassium, and all these different things. Yeah, and certainly sodium and chloride. Uh, um. Let's see, uh, make, make, make total sense. Um, all right, well, great. I, I think that's a good point about the, uh, the morning sickness, um, uh, about the low HCL. That, that's really great. Um, let's see. And, and, cer and certainly, um, I, I know probably Tony knows this, but, but doing that pericardium six point in terms of acupuncture, that, that can be helpful. Things like that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Ginger and stuff. Um, what else? Um, I, think, I think we're almost up to one. Um, uh, Jen, any other thoughts here? Or uh, I think we all of our nutritionists are here too. So any, any other thoughts here? Uh, maybe Ayla, you want to talk about anything else? Um, this has been a great um, overview of fertility and pregnancy and how to use functional nutrition to really uh, move the needle, so to speak, on you know people trying to get um, pregnant and, and uh, increase their fertility. Would you ever use digestive enzymes in pregnant women? 
that's another one. So I would say no, digestive enzymes, I mean, they're pretty powerful and there's questions on whether or not like early in conception implantation, you can dissolve an embryo um, and mm, high dose digestive yeah, enzymes. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. So I, I mean, unless someone had like exocrine, digestive enzymes. If someone had exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and they needed it, then you, you, that means just medical. Yeah, then it's, then you know, a, kind of a cost kind of benefit. Cost yeah, benefit. yeah, but um, I'm, maybe, I'm personally not comfortable. I'd rather do yeah. apple cider vinegar yeah. um, to help you with digest. Ginger, right. as Dr. Wong mentioned. Yeah, um, yeah. Got it. Um, help the stomach acid. How about um, herbs? Any any safe herbs in pregnancy or herbs for fertility in general? I know that's a very general question, but yeah. So you guys be careful of herbs. So the way I would say is, if you're working with herbs, don't just order something and take it. Work with a right. practitioner because there right. are a lot of herbs that are contraindicated in right. pregnancy. So right. even sage peppermint, some of these things have been shown to increase risk for miscarriage. Mm, um, so you wow. want to be really careful with yeah. herbs. So Vitex, Chaseberry is kind of well known um, in the first three months to be used for hormonal balance. Mm -hmm. um, you also want good quality products. So ordering through a practitioner because there's a lot of products out there that have contaminants in them and herbs can be a, a source of that. So you want to make sure you're using good products. Rhodiola has been shown to be safe in mm -hmm. pregnancy um but i'd be really i'm generally really careful yeah about that too. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that well thank you so much anina for coming on it's great to see you and um again uh anina's practice is simplina nutrition which sounds to me like a really well a good tasting pasta but <laughs> that's a great <laughs> nutritional <laughs> practice good free right <laughs> good free pasta <laughs> yes exactly um yeah i hope you and your family are doing well and um we will uh, catch up soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. And thank you to all of those who listened today. Thank you. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.